Living a life in full is a conversation you always wanted to have with that person who gave an amazing TED Talk, or the author of one of your favorite books, or that inspirational Olympian you always wanted to know more about. It's graduate-level conversations with those making a difference in the world and in the lives of others. This show brings you new ideas and approaches so that you can live a life in full. I'm your host, Dr. Chris Stout, and I hope you enjoy this episode. This episode of Living a Life in Full is brought to you by my publishers. Some of you may know that I started a nonprofit, Center for Global Initiatives, about 10 years ago to do global health and humanitarian work. And if you're longtime listeners to the show, then you know that a number of our guests have that as a common thread, humanitarian work or global health or, or a combination of the both. So uh, a, a nice shout out to the publishers of uh, these three books, which I'm going to highlight. Uh, all proceeds of royalties will go to supporting the Center for Global Initiatives. So if you're interested, hopefully you'll get a good read that you can enjoy and uh, also do some good by um, sponsoring the work that we do uh, through the Center for Global Initiatives, which you can find out more about that work at centerforglobalinitiatives.org. The three books are The Humanitarian Field Guide, which is a, a very quick and easy, put it in your pocket, take it along with you uh, kind of guide. Uh, the New Humanitarians, which I did some time back looking at about 45 different organizations, each chapter being kind of an in-depth interview of them, of how they started, what their uh, work is, um, what their wins were, what some of their losses were, and uh, how to kind of start your own, depending upon whatever space that's in. We have uh, three different volumes of that, focusing in three different broad areas. And then finally, and uh, most recently, is Why Global Health Matters. Uh, we have a website dedicated specifically to it, so you can go there and learn more about it or order it, and which is called whyglobalhealthmatters.org. And we're very thrilled. Uh, it's an edited work, and the foreword is done by Jody Williams, who is a good friend and, as you may know, uh, is a Nobel laureate uh, for her work in landmine uh, issues vis-a-vis -vis, uh, winning the Nobel Peace Prize for that back in the late 90s. And it's a uh, edited work of uh, 60 individuals who are just really experts in their areas. And the uniting united thread through all that is uh, focusing on global health. So please take a look, go research them, look at those websites. Um, you can buy them at your favorite bookseller or online through Amazon.com uh, in um, uh, paperback or uh, hardcover. Or some of them, I think New Humanitarians is hardcover and uh, uh, Kindle or digitally as well. So uh, take a look. Thanks very much. A quick show note before this episode starts. Tim and I did this interview via Skype. And towards the tail end, like maybe around the last four to five minutes, uh, there were some Skype hiccups where we had some disconnection. So we tried to edit that down and out as much as possible, but there's still a little, uh, some pauses there that we couldn't quite tweak out enough. So please bear with us. Um, we can still hear what's said, but um, it's just not as uh, high quality as the uh, other 98% of the episode. Thanks. Welcome to another episode of Living a Life in Full. I'm your host, Dr. Chris Stout. Today, I'm very excited to uh, have my guest, Dr. Tim Erickson, on. He's a, an old, dear friend uh, who I haven't gotten to uh, catch up with in a while, so today we'll be able to do that together. Uh, Dr. Erickson is a Harvard Humanitarian Initiative core faculty member with expertise in environmental toxicology and crisis and climate change. He is also an active humanitarian uh, physician involved in a variety of different kinds of health projects and in particular right now in conflict regions of Ukraine and Syria. Dr. Erickson is also an emergency medicine physician at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston where he serves as chief of medical toxicology in the Department of Emergency Medicine. Dr. Erickson earned his MD degree from the Chicago Medical School in 1986. He completed emergency medicine residency training at the University of Illinois and his Medical Toxicology Fellowship at Cook County Hospital. Dr. Erickson is a fellow of the American College of Emergency Physicians, American College of Medical Toxicology, American Academy of Clinical Toxicology, and perhaps maybe the most fun one, he's a, a member of the prestigious National Geographic Explorers Club, which we're going to do a deep dive into. 
Previous, <laughs> previously, Dr. Erickson served as the director for the UIC Center of Global Health, where he was the founder and professor of emergency medicine and medical toxicology at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Dr. Erickson also served as the associate dean for faculty affairs, graduate medical education, and continuing medical education. He was an acting and interim head in the Department of uh, Emergency Medicine and the Emergency Medicine Residency Training Program. Dr. Erickson has been a member of multiple editorial boards and has a prolific academic history, including publishing over 120 original journal articles and book chapters, as well as editing four major textbooks. He's presented over 100 national and international invited lectures related to emergency medicine, toxicology, humanitarian global health, and wilderness expedition medicine. He has extensive international experience in Africa, including Rwanda, Sudan, and Kenya, in Asia, including India, Vietnam, and Nepal, and South America, including Brazil, Peru, and Argentina, and also in Europe, in Kosovo, Ukraine, and France, and even in Antarctica, and I want to know what he was doing in Antarctica. So uh, with that, I'm afraid we're out of time, Tim, and uh, we've really enjoyed having <laughs> you on. <laughs> now, it's, it's great to have you on. Good to, good to reconnect, man. It's good to be on, Chris, and I appreciate all the great work you've been doing and definitely been following your illustrious humanitarian career. So it's a pleasure to be on and to chat about things and try to make the world a little better place. Oh, thanks. I, I have said to many people, if I weren't older than you, I'd want to grow up and be you. <laughs> so <laughs> so how, how long have we known each other? Has it been 15-ish years? I was trying to do the math. Does that sound possible? Does that sound right? I, th I think that's about that, right. Yeah, we'll, I th I, okay. Because we'll towards the second decade. Yeah, and I, I think it was back in the day. I think I was uh, uh, specifically on faculty in the Department of Psychiatry at the College of Medicine at, at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And, and I guess like most strong uh, brotherhoods, uh, what brought us together was terrorism or bioterrorism. Was that it? Do you recall? I believe it was. It was during the... Uh weapons of mass destruction era mm -hmm. of scare, the global scare of that, which some of it was legitimate, some of it was probably a little over-dramatized, but uh, be that as it may, we were involved in uh, some educational initiatives and some HRSA-funded research That's and right. certainly with the weapons of mass destruction, you need a really good mental health expert <laughs> and you need a really good uh, toxicology bioterrorism expert so and i have to say i i, I guess it's gotten gotten retired now since you're not um, at, at uh, uic anymore and now at harvard but i i have to say and i think this really kind of s speaks to who you are your wasn't your um, email tox boy at uic.edu that's right chris yeah. never to be a <laughs> I never even reached uh, tox teen, or <laughs> uh, let alone man. Uh, so yeah, I was tox boy for the longest time, and I'm still tagged by that in, in good sense. It, it, it is interesting every once in a while when you had a uh, 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 prestigious scholar, Nobel laureate, <laughs> and or big donor come by and say, "And what's your uh, uh, what's your email address?" <laughs> and then I would get a few that went. So, Toy Boy, can we meet some? <laughs> I said, that's, that's Tox Boy. <laughs> yeah, get, uh, get that straight. So, well, that's even better. Let's still meet. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. So, yeah. And, and I actually tried to get that handle at Harvard, and uh, the, the, the scholars said, we don't think so, not in this territory. <laughs> that's, that's too bad. <laughs> well, well, you... <laughs> Big pond, you are no longer talks with. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, but I, 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 that's near and dear to my heart. Yeah, I always liked that. So, so when we uh, like got together, I think it was maybe on the cusp of you getting started with the development of the um, Center for Global Health there at the College of Medicine. So, can you walk us through the genesis of that? What started it? How did you start it? What was your role? Well, it, it really was a response to not just global issues at hand and a real love and drive to try to make things a little better, at least in a small corner of the world, if not many corners of the world, but it was really student-driven. Um, we had medical students at the time in Chicago, and by the way, UIC at that time was the largest medical school in the country 
and very proudly uh, one of the more diverse medical schools in the country. And these students, many of them came as uh, um, sons and daughters of immigrants, um, first generation U.S. citizens. Mm -hmm. Some of them came from uh, international settings and their stories were incredible how they made it to the United States and what it took to get into medical school. So their, their stories were wonderful and yet they really had a demand for making a difference in their world and wanted global health outreach, global health experience. And it was almost, Chris, like a resurgence of what you and I grew up with with the Peace Corps, mm. uh, which was terrific. It was really a groundswell, a grassroots movement to make a difference. Um, and because of that, the medical school administration really didn't know what to do um, and, and said, we really need an initiative which is student-driven and yet uh, look at these initiatives academically, study them, evaluate them, and let's see what we can do with this. And at the time, global health was catching on as a concept across the country, uh, so we kind of rode that groundswell. So to answer the question, it really was student-driven, and then really what became exciting is global health is not just global medicine, it's just not about physicians, it's about PhDs and nurses and pharmacists and dentists and public health specialists and just volunteers all across the country that want to be involved. And uh, then it really became more of a center when you did so I, that I, I I didn't really realize that aspect with the uh, the groundswell from students, and it it seems like uh, when you're talking about kind of the that wave, there's also at um, Feinberg at Northwestern now a center as well, and then also um, at University of Chicago, and, and then you the three uh, centers were starting to collaborate and coordinate too. Is that right? Yes, it is. And those are tremendous institutions, historic institutions, both University of Chicago, uh, Northwestern University, and also a great program was coming out of Loyola University. By the way, uh, I don't think Northwestern U of I or U of C have ever been to the Final Four, but uh, Loyola <laughs> has. <laughs> there you go. Well, a lot in 1963. So, I mean, if we didn't bring in Loyola, we'd be... Uh, really short-sighted. So they were, um, and, and the Jesuit uh, global outreach has really been impressive for many decades, mm -hmm. uh, centuries. So Loyola was another one. Rush uh, University was yet another one. So we really started looking at many of these universities with medical schools and started to work together, which is the way it should be. And even though we're siloed in many ways, and if you think you're siloed in Chicago, just come to Boston. <laughs> it's it's uh, an amazing place to be, but there's a lot of uh, uh, collaborative efforts that are really making a difference, but there's also some siloed institutions. Sure. So it's to break those down, and the thing that really broke it down, to be honest, was nothing to do with me um, or any one person or even a team. It was the disaster in Haiti. Mm -hmm. uh, or uh, people came together for a common good. And it just made sense. And I know you're going to have on your show coming up soon, Dr. Janet Lynn, one of my heroes. Mm -hmm. And she was really instrumental in driving that. And I give her a lot of credit. You may want to ask her about it. She'll tell the story better than I. Absolutely. This was a terrific example of universities working together for a greater cause. Um, and it wasn't just Haiti that made sense. As you know, Chicago is a wonderful tapestry of diversity, mm -hmm. uh, incredible neighborhoods, um, many languages and cultures, religions uh, that are just kind of catapulted together. Right. And, 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 and what we found is you didn't need to go to Haiti or Angola yeah. or Paul. Yeah. Jakarta, you, you could go to the west side of Chicago, four blocks down into the Austin neighborhood. You could go into the Englewood neighborhood to the south. 
and find humanitarian needs Mm -hmm. and actually in some cases greater than fraud Mm -hmm. tragically um so people started to realize the the local which was a term that was often (laughs) local initiatives Mm -hmm. could be made when people said i'd love to go abroad but i really can't because of family issues because of my education for whatever reason we'd always say get involved locally Mm -hmm. and there is a international group right around the corner that could use your help and that seemed to also spur on much more growth uh, which was terrific and really fun to be a part of yeah yeah I, i really liked the thought that you didn't need a passport to be able to do global health. I mean, that's one of the things I think that's not necessarily unique to Chicago, but certainly one of the the interesting strengths of it as well, too. I know we have some uh, specific refugee and uh, displaced people populations, and, you know, there's a variety of different kinds of medical and mental health and social and uh, educational, you know, needs that those populations have. And it's nice to be able to have a group of people that sometimes share, you know, an ethnicity or share some things in common with them that can then bring, you know, certain kinds of help to them as well. So I, I think that's fantastic. On a personal side, so that, you know, it's, it's good to hear sort of like your initiation, because I know that you're always, you know, doing a variety of things around the world. But tell us your origin story. Um, tell us about how did you balance raising four amazing kids with another accomplished emergency room doc and professor and have such an adventuresome life, which we're going to get more into, but then also uh, getting involved in the humanitarian work that you did. What's the, what's your origin story there? Well, that's a, it's a great question. I have to give my, my parents a lot of credit. Mom and dad always had uh, a really, and still do, uh, a very kind heart for anyone, regardless of their ethnicity or background or socioeconomic status. Um, my father was a uh, professor at a university in religion, philosophy, Greek, and religions of the world, really. So I, I got a nice lens into how other people believed and, and, and was really impressed by his accepting nature uh-huh. and his drive for higher education being you know, such an important investment to make in that uh, lives in me. In fact, as a college professor, he, he taught for 51 years and wow. never missed, never missed a class wow. and was always reading his lectures to try to fit in with the next generation. In fact, I remember once in the nineties, he said, you know, that boy band, that's kind of popular, Tim, you know, it's in sync. Is that common spelling? S I N K. Cause I'm trying to, <laughs> update my lecture to connect with 18 year olds. Wow. So, <laughs> so <laughs> incredible with a charitable heart. And then my mom is, uh, uh, I guess you're always a nurse. You never retire, but she was a nurse and a night nurse for a surgical ward where the nursing to patient ratio was 30 to one. Oh uh, now gosh. it's four to one. You hear nurses saying it's a little heavy handed. So, um, she really had a really amazing influence on me to pursue not just healthcare but a humanitarian sector. And then, um, kind of fast forwarding to my career after um, emergency medicine training, which was in the inner city of Chicago and very international, as we've discussed. Uh, and I really loved that patient population and meeting them, trying to meet the needs of those individuals from diverse backgrounds, but also did my toxicology training, as you mentioned, at Cook County Hospital, which is, you talk about international. Oh, yeah. It's a, and, and there was one point in time, I think it was maybe in the 1970s, where they said uh, nearly 40% of all healthcare providers in the country of the U.S. had at some point done some type of training at Cook County Hospital. I mean, it was an incredible um, place to learn not only medicine, but toxicology, yeah. the drugs of use, uh, the psychologic effects, the environmental effects, um, pharmaceutical agents. And one of my favorite is, uh, the natural venoms mm-hmm. and, uh, biologic issues. Um, with that fellowship, we got a cry for help 
from the Amazon of all places to a mutual friend where a physician named Fernando Branches, he's a cardiologist that trained in the finest universities of Brazil and Rio, but wanted to go back to his roots, his origin in, um, in, in the areas of the Amazon basin and give back those he grew up with. Very accomplished man. And he called us and he said, I have a need for an environmental toxicologist. And we said, well, what can we do to help you out? And he said, well, I think I am dealing with gold poisoning or toxicity. I have these gold miners in the Amazon basin, all with symptoms, neurologic symptoms, psychologic symptoms. Um, and I think it's from the gold mining industry. And could you come down, analyze this, and also do some gold levels? Wow. And what's interesting about this, he said, well, Fernando, uh, also with the gold industry, are they using anything else? And he said, well, well yeah, they, they mix the gold amalgam, the gold ore, with mercury. Yeah, and then they fire off or steam off the mercury, and um, that get re gets released in the environment. But I think it's more the gold. And... Truth be told, he's a cardiologist and saw many of these individuals just, again, as a, a, a humanitarian physician who had a calling to help all those. And so we went down there, to make a long story short, to analyze environmental mercury poisoning and uh, the effects of gold mining. And um, we found enormously high levels, not in gold miners, but in the surrounding villages. And of course, as you know, with mercury poisoning, that's into the water system, mm -hmm. the food supply, and then um, starts poisoning downstream. And we actually found the elevated mercury levels in the Yanomani people, uh, considered to be some of the most remote, pristine, last corners of the world where you'd expect to see environmental poisoning. Um, wow. So of his life and because of his outreach we had a window into the gold mining industry which we never would have had that opportunity without him because they trusted us they trusted him to allow us to take urine blood samples hair samples and start documenting this and if you fast forward to present day there's gold mining all over the world um and unfortunately, most places like in Africa, Indonesia, the Philippines, Peru, Brazil, they're still using mercury. Um, and it's really having a cost, no, I'm only on the environment, but on those that are vulnerable, the women, the children. Uh, many of the children are forced to do mining. Mm -hmm. uh, many women, often pregnant, are told to use the mercury in the amalgam um, and it's 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 become a real problem and it was dr. branches that uh, gave us this opportunity and turned me onto the possibility of making an impact environmentally from a humanitarian viewpoint um, and also being in the middle of the Amazon was just my dream as a boy <laughs> and sure uh, to be dealing with uh, wildlife and venoms and snakes and spiders uh, bigger than the size of the head and the snake, longer wow. than a Buick Sabre. Um, <laughs> I guess I'm kidding myself. Uh, do you make a Sabre anymore? I, I think it actually made a comeback. Yeah, that was, that was actually my first car. So I, 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 I know the size of it in the 60s. I know what that was like. So. <laughs> Well, I, I pictured you driving an El Camino. Oh, yeah. I still picture that. <laughs> we all hope for that we can be driving in the, the horizon. You know? So, but, um, but no, his, and, and the last thing I'll say about Fernando, he lost his life. He oh. himself uh, became mercury poisoned uh, oh. because so closely with this and felt he needed to help these people and he lost his life. So he, he's one of these unsung heroes mm. that you never hear about um, that really made a difference and, and uh, had a huge influence on me. Right. Uh, launched me into not only environmental work, but 
humanitarian work and a big picture of sustainability in a small area of the world where you can make an impact. Wow. That's quite a story. I think it really blends together because I, I was always kind of curious about the environmental kinds of things. And I, I was too naive to, to exactly understand because I thought, well, is it, you know, is it the, the toxins that would be in, you know, venomous animals or, or whatnot versus just pollutants like you were talking about? And I was curious. I mean, I'm, I'm so sad to hear about his demise, but, the, you know, I, I think oftentimes when, you know, health care providers and, and people in risk areas by virtue of environment or by virtue of war or trauma or whatever oftentimes are are in harm's way. And sometimes it's through this kind of a scenario that, that took his life. And I think probably some of the things that we'll get into here in a few minutes of um, some of the risks that uh, – that you and your colleagues, Michael and others, have, have experienced. But on a, on a lighter note, before we go into that, um, how did you and Val meet? Yeah. Well, first of all, my wife, Valerie, uh, last name Gobia, um, is definitely my better, smarter half. So I often tell people I did marry up. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, she, she and I uh, continue to work together. We're both emergency physicians. I'm very proud of her. She does a lot of wonderful impact work with women's global health and um, vulnerable women and children populations and also is a tremendous emergency physician um, and educator. So it's it's been nice that we've had uh, dual careers that cross over. A lot of people say, well, you work together, you live together, you raise children together, you know, uh, how does that all work out? I don't know if I could work with my spouse or partner or significant other. I think it's terrific. It complements each other. And then when we go to international destinations or globally, we can go together. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a lot of colleagues who travel without their family or their spouses or their significant others. And, and it takes its toll because you really do have to spend a lot of time in the field to make a difference and to have a sustained program and to build capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm really blessed uh, to have her, uh, not only in my life, but to have a similar career. And she allows me to think outside the box and to come up with harebrained schemes. And, uh, <laughs> and oftentimes she'll roll her eyes and say, okay, well, go for it. Uh, uh, some of the stuff you, you throw against the wall sticks, a lot of it doesn't, but uh, she's been really supportive of me uh, thinking big and, and trying to be unique. That's great. I would think that she has a, you know, a very fine grained understanding of those kinds of things. I mean, the, the academic side of things, the training side of things, the medical school, the travel, the humanitarian. I mean, it really seems like the, the two of you are very complimentary yin and yang kind of, uh, you know, uh, duo, which is, which is wonderful. And I think quite rare. So I, I think that's really terrific. Yeah, she'll laugh at my jokes too. When they're not very good. <laughs> that's a key thing. That's a key. I, that's, that's a very key thing. My kids don't get my humor, but, but thank goodness my wife does. So that's good. So I, I, the next <clears throat> set of questions I couldn't really organize because I think it's sort of like a big Venn diagram with a lot of overlaps and things. But I know that um, you have a history of, of mountaineering and climbing, um, obviously uh, a lot of international travel that's, you know, for, for work and for humanitarian and for pleasure. Um, I know that you're very involved in the area of uh, wilderness and expedition medicine, which makes a lot of sense, I think, also vis-a-vis -vis emergency and then your humanitarian work. So we may bounce around a little bit, uh, so I, I hope this will be a little you know, organized in, in some way. But um, so when... I actually have a tension deficit disorder <laughs> and uh, it goes right along with my personality to be tangential right. and bounce around. Then this Much will... more comfortable in that chaos. No, this will be very fun then for both of us. So, so you and Valerie um, both were recruited to come out to, to Harvard. Was that because of um, your residency pal, Michael? Did he convince the two of you to make that move or, or what, uh, how did you wind out and, and wind up in Beantown? Yeah, I, a lot of it did. Uh, uh, Mike Van Royen, who's a dear friend uh, and is a dear friend, we trained with in residency at University of Illinois in Chicago. Um, 
after he developed an international program there, and, and we always saw him as uh, uh, a difference maker and a leader. In fact, uh, his personal statement going into residency described basically what he's doing now. And he left Chicago to uh, direct programs at Johns Hopkins and then went uh, on to Harvard where he is the Department Head of Emergency Medicine, but also directs HHI, which is Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. And he's been great. Uh, I did a lot of work with him internationally in our early careers in areas of conflict like Rwanda, Sudan, Kosovo, Somalia. Wow. And we always wanted to work together, and he's been trying to make that happen. And uh, he did a great job recruiting us, and obviously it wasn't just me. He wanted to recruit Valerie. And, uh, and once our four beautiful, amazing children... Camille, Isabel, Celeste, and Julian were through college and thriving and doing great. And on graduate school, we figured it was a good time uh, with our empty nest to give it a whirl. And if we weren't going to do it now, when are you going to do it? Sure. And so we made the transition. And interesting, uh, we were so used to Chicago. Chicago will always be home in our hometown. Um, it was tough to make the transition. Uh, I've never lived outside of uh, the great state of Illinois. I'll be darned. Uh, un un until then. Uh, established in 1818, by the way, Chris. <laughs> you, 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 I, I'm never playing against you in any trivia game. <laughs> well, we came to the, con not the state, but the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Don't you dare call it a state. A state, right. <laughs> right out. Take you by your ear. Uh, that you're <laughs> But uh, no, we came here and just developing uh, a new system, a new healthcare system, um, was more of a challenging than I thought. But the the opportunities here are amazing. The people here are amazing. We are warned that people are going to be standoffish and uh, rather pompous. Uh, we haven't found that to be the case at all. Uh, wonderful people here, very collaborative, real difference makers. And it's just not on the health side. I mean, working with people in law and architecture and business and public health and nursing, it's, it's just been an amazing experience and a neat part of the country to be in with its colorful history. That's and cool. Northeast. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's yeah. you guys have really been getting wallop this year. So. We're wallop, but, uh, right. You know, we're from the area, from Chicago. So yeah. They're, they're like, <laughs> yeah. Bob. No big deal. So... So okay. then, um, you're, it's is it sort of like a joint appointment at Brigham and Women's as well as uh, participation in the Heart, uh, Humanitarian Initiative? Yes, it is. It's it's both. Uh, we're happy to be members of Brigham and Women's Hospital. I also am faculty at Boston Children's oh. Hospital with the Poison Center and then the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. And we do a lot of work too with Dana Farber Cancer Institute. So it's 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 been great, uh, and they do allow us dual, triple, quadruple appointments um, That's great. To, to do that kind of work. And Mike uh, has been Mike Van Ryan has been terrific in about allowing autonomy and for us to create and try to build these big out of the box type of projects. Well, that's the kind of innovation I think that, you know, all is just as a hand in glove kind of fit for you and Valerie and, and Michael as well. So is there an overlap between Partners in Health and Paul Farmer in the in the humanitarian initiative? Or is that pretty much is that one of the silos? No, I don't think it is. Uh, I, I think Paul Farmer's work is tremendous. And Mike Van Ryan and Paul get along really well. Great. Very Jill. And it, it, it's it's a little different. The the humanitarian side is 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 more in conflict and war. Mm. Um, a lot of humanitarian uh, rights, and it isn't that Paul Farmer's Global Health Shop Partners in Health doesn't go into that arena, but they're uh, more in sustainability, capacity building. Certainly, they had a really significant and impactful response in Haiti mm -hmm. to the Ebola crisis, and they continue to work in Rwanda. No, we have great respect for Paul's uh, program, and there's a lot of cross-pollinization and mutual respect. That's great. <clears throat> Excuse me. The... Uh... 
I think this is a true story. I had heard some years ago at a conference that um, Paul and, and his colleagues at Partners uh, had been invited by the city of Boston to come and help develop a um, HIV initiative based upon the work that they had done in Haiti. And I thought it was just such a wonderful opposite of the traditional, you know, West knows best kind of thing. It was like the West saying, okay. you know, hey, how, how, you know, resourceful Haiti, you know, how can, how can we learn and what can we do and scale in Boston of, you know, what you've been able to do in Haiti? I just thought that was amazing. Yeah, it is. You, you really, we don't know all the answers and oftentimes the countries we work in and help us, we're doing a project in India now that, uh, working with my UIC partners on still, um, India Heart Rescue, Heart Rescue India. And the level of cardiovascular disease in India far exceeds what we're seeing in the United States, if you believe it. Really? And we're learning from India how to best myocardial infarction, sudden cardiac arrest um, in the U.S. from lessons learned in India. So oh, uh, I think we have all the answers and the best uh, ways of approaching things it is not only wrong, it's naive. Yeah. And it's not how you end into a long-term project. You really have to find out what they need. Uh, I remember a, 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 a speech by the Rwandan Minister of Health, an extraordinary woman, who, who said, I wish people would quit telling us in Rwanda what we need. And if someone would just ask us, what what do we need? <laughs> yeah. Tell us what we need. Yeah. And, and that type of attitude goes a long way. Yeah, I think, sadly, I think this has evolved. I think it's much, much better than, than years or decades ago. But there's such hubris, uh, you know, from the, the stereotypic West knows best approach of coming in. And, you know, we know how to do it so well. And it's like, a, man, of all things, we know how to do health care well. <laughs> you know, so we certainly have a, most, our own difficult times with it, you know, here stateside. So... So speaking of Michael, um, I have to ask, didn't you and Mike summit Aconcagua together? Is that right? Am yeah, I... we, uh, we, we climbed uh, Aconcagua. It's, it's uh, fun to say Aconcagua. Yeah, you can say it better than I can. So. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, some Argentinian would tell me <laughs> butchering it. But, uh, no, it's, it's, we've had some fun times together in, um, in South America and also in Nepal and and as you know, Chris, you're a mountaineer. Uh, mountaineering isn't necessarily a spectator sport as mm. much as Nova and the mm. 3D movies would like you to right. think. It's, it's very slow, methodical, and oftentimes it's not technical, but it's just adapting to altitude and right. climbing hey. yourself. And uh, yeah, we've, we've done climbing. I love the mountains as you do. I, I love with my oxygen, my pulse ox goes into the low 60s. <laughs> <laughs> drugs I mean, who needs hallucinogens just, yeah just little little blue lips and fingertips and you're all set so. yeah that's right that's right it's better than lsd i think <laughs> so and you, wrong you, with you you've done everest base camp a number of times too well, i thought right? you've done lsd no <laughs> no we're not going there that's that's a different show okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah yeah i've i've uh I've been in Everest Base Camp a few times, and in fact, uh, um, we were there right, we had just gotten off uh, the mountain when uh, Earthquake hit a 15, oh, wow. and you look back on that, we were, it was fresh fallen snow, beautiful blue bird type skies, sunshine, it was a setup for an avalanche, mm. um, fresh snow and hot sun, Sure. and then put on... Uh, top of that an earthquake uh it was uh unbelievable and it was interesting we had just done a conference the week prior in Kathmandu on how to prepare for earthquakes and disasters oh my gosh they're very involved people they knew it was coming uh, that area gets an earthquake every 75 years you can almost set your sundial to it really and, it, and it's been around 80 81 years so they knew this was coming thank god it didn't hit a major um, urban area, mm -hmm. at least the epicenter, um, but it did tragically take a lot of life and yeah. a lot of Sherpa friends we had lost their lives. So mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it, uh, what you realize is those people that live in that austere environment are amazing. And they're wonderful, sweet, spiritual mm-hmm. people. And as you know, you, you climb these mountains, you, you go a million miles an hour at work and in life and leading up to the expedition or climb. Uh, and you finally get a chance to slow down and um, and take it all in. And I know you've done a lot of this, and for good causes. And I applaud you for that. But there's there's nothing better than being above the clouds. So yeah. Yeah. it's it's been a terrific uh, slice of life, and we're blessed with the opportunity. Because quite frankly, it's not a inexpensive sport. Right. Uh, and uh, it's always been great to climb with chirpas and porters and people from the area and really get to know them as individuals they're mm-hmm. incredible athletes mm-hmm. that's <clears throat> actually one of the how the i did uh, kilimanjaro in 92 and one of the porters there in africa uh, was a person that uh, we've kept in touch since 1992 we helped yep. uh, worked with them to found a kindergarten we still consult with them through the nonprofit that i started at two hospitals in the moshi region so you really do. You spend that kind of time and, and in a sense, you know, sort of self-inflicted hardship, but you really get to know people and you really develop long-lasting relationships, which is a wonderful sort of side benefit of doing that. So um, I also, speaking of thin air, um, my daughter and I went to uh, one of the Big Sky Wilderness Medicine conferences a few years back. and. Yeah, and I and she feel dog. she fielded one of your rubber snakes, if you recall. <laughs> so, yeah. so well, and well deserved. She's she's smart. The apple doesn't fall far from her. <laughs> she's a great young woman, and I uh, was very impressed with her her serpentine knowledge. She didn't. <laughs> that wasn't a lob or a. <laughs> she actually answered the question correctly. She deserved that. <laughs> she, and I think that I think I even know where that snake is today. So uh, our <laughs> her mother cool. wasn't too happy with it, but yeah. uh, it's it served a lot of fun in our house since then. But yeah. um, how did you get involved? That was such a wonderful conference. Um, and just for people that aren't familiar with it, my little soundbite of it. There's a lot of. You know, Tim did um, the work on like all the toxicology aspects of all the, you know, creepy crawlies and, and aquatics and you you name it. If it can sting you and hurt you, that's what, you know, Tim covered with wonderful PowerPoints and slides and stories and just, you know, all the other kinds of uh, just wonderful experts that came to it for, for us adults. But then there's also a uh, youth program where uh, Annika learned how to... Um, uh, escape from a hotel if there was like a hostile circumstance or, or a, uh, some kind of, you know, uh, earthquake or something like that in a hotel. She learned how to like jimmy a hotel sealed window and just all sorts of, you know, just really wonderful practical things. So it was like one of these conferences where it was perfectly fine, you know, to bring your family or, or bring your kids or, or whoever because there was things for people to, to do. I, I just thought the, the whole idea with uh, that conference was, was terrific. Can you speak more about that or uh, how you got involved in that? Oh, sure. Um, well, first of all, uh, it's a wonderful group. We're like family. Uh, Eric Weiss from Stanford, uh, Gene Allred, who we just lost uh, colon cancer, God rest his soul, this year. I didn't know uh, that. Oh, God. Yeah, oh. lost Gene. Uh, fortunately, his son Kyle has kind of taken over his responsibilities and is doing a wonderful job working with Eric Weiss. Uh, uh, people like Joe Serra, um, uh, Paul Auerbach, some wonderful people in wilderness medicine have got that whole subject matter going. And what's amazing about it is, you, like you said, Chris, it's not just emergency physicians and um, in, in doctors, it's people in pediatrics and obstetrics, gynecology, internal medicine, psychiatry, psychology, paramedics, nurses, um, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, uh, pathologists, dermatologists. I know I'm going to lose some of but everyone comes and they just want to be part of the great outdoors. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, what we've also put on this is uh, a touch of global health and humanitarianism. And not just going and exploring Austin environments and saying, been there, done that, check it off my bucket list. Actually giving back to the community, giving back to um, a healthcare system, 
um, and really making a difference and leaving it in a better way than how you found it, at least not making it worse. So mm -hmm. it's been a wonderful group. Um, I got an opportunity to lecture there in the, the 90s, and, and it went um, well enough where they asked me back. And I've been there for about 20 years. And wow. the snake one is interesting. Actually, a giant in the field, one of my heroes, is Finley Russell. And if you know herpetology and nature, Finley Russell is like the Jacques Cousteau of snakes. Really? I mean, the best thing I can best analogy I can come up with. He had written hundreds of articles and books on snakes. And um, I had listened to him talk, and he, he really treated everyone uh, with respect. I was a student at the time, and he gave me the time of day. He was like my idol. And um, Finley was well into his 80s and 90s and started tiring out of it. And I was lucky enough to be asked to kind of start giving some of his talks and I never could hold a candle to him, let alone a forked tongue. <laughs> um, <laughs> little talks but, humor there, right? <laughs> but I carried it on and um, he's, anyway, he's another one of those iconic individuals I was lucky enough to know um, and, and uh, just carry on some of his love for snakes and some of those animals that a lot of people would rather not have on the planet, but they serve a very important function in our ecosystem and they're misunderstood a lot mm -hmm. like sharks and some of the other things that we just feel we should have control over. But again, they were here first right? and uh, they're much needed and fascinating creatures. So uh, uh, that's another way I kind of got groped into doing this. Uh, uh, because of Finley's legacy. Wow, it seems like a perfect, perfect fit. So with some of the things that we've been talking about, I, I'm guessing that's kind of shot you towards the, uh, or put you on the trajectory towards the uh, National Ge Geographic Explorers Club. But how does how does one gain membership in that? And once you're in it, what uh, what's, what's involved in that? It's a secret Teddy Roosevelt handshake. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that I can't say anything about. <laughs> okay. no, well, well really... did, you can tell me I'll edit it all out. No one else will learn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, it, 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 it's been around since the Roosevelt administration. Uh, and uh, some amazing people um, uh, like Sir Edmund Hillary and Buzz Aldrin and um, uh, Picard, who's well known for... Uh, flying balloons around the world and Sylvia Earle, who, you know, it's not just an old boys club of explorers. She's one of the great scientists who has dove to the depths of the sea and just some amazing individuals. And, and basically you have to be nominated by some members uh, and have made an impact in a corner of the world or discovered a new species or been to a place that's never been explored and it, it will it really stemmed from my original work thanks to Fernando branches in the Amazon with mercury poisoning wow. and the alertness that he had to make this a global issue not just a issue in the village in the Amazon he saw this as something that was a real tragedy uh, to mother earth as he put it we're harming mother earth not just the Amazon um, and affecting lives. So because of that work and working with him and bringing that into the medical health and public eye, uh, that's, I guess, the way I got in and then learned the, se the secret handshake. And uh, <laughs> what's really exciting is my daughter, uh, Isabel, who's a marine biologist, uh, eco-evil biologist, um, I got to bring her, uh, last year was at Ellis Island, Oh, wow. And brought her along, and they're really pushing for young members and female members and trying to hand it off to the next generation. So I'm trying to get her involved. That's great. Really well, uh, how, how fitting for the both of you. I, that's, I was yeah. just so curious about that. It's like one of those things that never just sort of comes up in a conversation. Oh, hey, Tim, by the way, how'd that work? So just that's a wonderful story and, and just quite fitting and really kind of a, a you know respect to the legacy of your mentor too that's fantastic 
Well, I, I suspect this may not be quite similar, but uh, tell us about Toxicon. Is that like Comic-Con or what's what's Toxicon <laughs> all about? Do you dress up and you, you yeah, Spock or how does that work? Uh, yeah, we dress up like venomous creatures. You know, <laughs> like, uh, claws and rattles and, uh, and we uh, recite the periodic chart of elements backwards. <laughs> blindfolded you know things like that yeah, and uh yeah. the number pi out to 990 <laughs> decimals uh, so yeah that's what happens that's the, we have it next question that's toxic no it uh, uh my mentor in toxicology dan rahorchev who i'm doing a lot of work with right now in ukraine in the conflict zone um it was really his brainchild and it was bringing uh, Chicago-based programs together and do a common cause, knowing that poisoning is an issue. It really harms the environment, particularly children. And putting together an initiative where different institutions in Chicago, similar ones that we mentioned uh, with, the, with the Haiti crisis earlier, coming together to make Chicago a safer place in terms of poisonings. And it's uh, an initiative uh, that was uh, his brainchild, and it's really lived on. Steve Axe, a dear friend of, of mine, is, is overseeing it now in Chicago. And it's a model that uh, we're trying to bring to Boston as well. A lot of great toxicologic minds are here, but getting them to work together uh, is, in a consortium model is a real dream. Mm -hmm. So. Um, it's, it's still going strong and making a big difference. And, um, Mike Paul is the current poison center director. He does a terrific job. So there's really a lot of important people that carry on that Toxicon dream, but it's pretty cool. Toxicon is, um, Greek for, um, arrow, uh, the tip, the poison tip of an arrow, like oh. a cure. Uh -huh. So it's pretty, pretty cool name. And, uh, I do like your Comic-Con analogy. Yes. We are... <laughs> I saw some pictures on the web that, that we'll put in the show notes. <laughs> oh, that's good. Well, good. Thank you. So um, you got to work on the secret handshake with that one, too, I suppose. So um, Yeah, that, that, that one's like a secret poison and then an antidote. Yeah, rapidly. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. not hazing, though. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> well, I, I want to circle back to... Um, uh, Mike Van Royen for a second in some of the travel kinds of things. I read Mike's uh, book, The World's Emergency Room, and I thought it was really a, a wonderful book. And just you know, uh, share with him that uh, you know I just I was really inspired by it and and you know taken aback by some of the stories. And I know that you know you're, there's a, a mention of of you in there as well. And I guess the, for people that maybe aren't familiar with the book, I highly recommend it. We'll put a link in the show notes so where people can get it, but. Um, that that historically, you know, you sort of think of the Red Crosses were sort of like the safety zones and back in World War II or, you know, other points in time that, you know, you didn't bomb, you know, hospitals and you, you know, you, there was just sort of like a, a certain sets of rules that seem to be sort of thrown out of the window these days. And and, in, and not in a, in a matter of just oh, accidental kinds of things, but in the sense of what his book talks about is that humanitarian aid workers are really even being the targets of violence and and oftentimes I know that in humanitarian work there's a maybe historically um, you know it's it's an inadvertent kind of thing but now it sounds like you know that uh, people that uh, are involved with that in certain regions certain situations you know are really become the targets or the proxies you know for for violent focus um, and I know that you've been in some pretty dicey situations and you know from Mike's book he you know describes a number of his as well too um, can you share a few stories about what what your experience has been like that in conflict zones trying to uh, provide services? Oh yeah, it, it's you look back at the TV show MASH where every once in a while the MASH unit was a little under fire um, and also the issues do you take care of in that particular show both the South and the North Koreans um, and there was this neutrality type of initiative where if you had the Red Cross, if you were a hospital, 
you were a healthcare worker volunteering your time or being told to care for the wounded and civilians, that you were protected, that there were Geneva Convention rules established, some in the 1800s, uh, some 1949, I believe, uh, that predicted healthcare workers. But now, as you alluded to, Chris, they're a target. And, and not just those coming in in humanitarian NGO volunteer organizations to help, but those in-country physicians, nurses, paramedics are under fire, and hospitals have not become, oh, collateral damage. We meant to hit this infantry, this tank, but we accidentally hit the hospital. They're targeting hospitals. Wow. And Syria has been a prime example of that being a strategic means of warfare because if you take out those who are wounded and those trying to heal them, you're taking out the next set of infantry that might come back in. Mm -hmm. And and it also, when you take out the healthcare system, you're really causing a, a brain drain and that country will take years to come back. Um, we see, so you see the fleeing of healthcare physicians. You see those physicians that don't want to come in and volunteer because they're under fire. And this is even different than, say, the Ebola epidemic, where an infectious process was life threatening and really drove a lot of healthcare providers from not going there. Uh, this is to the point now where underground hospitals are having to be created. Paramedics are driving units at night without their lights on, covered in mud. So wow. they won't get, um, and women and children are being taken out as a message. Um, so it's changing and you say, well, wait a minute, this is in violation of human rights laws. It's a violation of the Geneva convention rules. And yet the people that are doing this in a strategic sense, maybe some of it accidental, but some of it strategic don't care about Geneva. <laughs> right, right, may, right. They may not even know where Geneva, Switzerland is, mm -hmm. uh, and yet they feel there's a higher calling. Sometimes it's for national pride, patriotism, sometimes in the name of religion. Uh, so it's a different era. And right now they say the most dangerous job in the world is not being a crab fisherman in the Bering Strait off Alaska, uh, and a dangerous catch. It's actually being a healthcare provider in Syria. Gosh, uh, the more dangerous jobs in the world. Wow. And uh, you talk about my uh, mentors and humanitarian care internationally, like Fernando Branches. I've worked with a surgeon, a true hero, one of our Harvard scholars at risk, who's now back, uh, Mahmoud Harari, a general surgeon who became a trauma surgeon, who now is trying to bring back the healthcare system of Syria and a lot of the besieged areas. A remarkable man that's uh, given his all, his, uh, his career, and put himself and family in danger, uh, trying to protect uh, innocent victims of these bombings. And I've had the chance to work with him the past two years, and he's another one of those amazing people that doesn't give enough recognition, but is in the field doing the work and doing it because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Wow. Uh, it just, it's, it really is a different world. I mean, I understand the realities of those kinds of situations and it just, I, I, you know, I, I've always highly respected people that have, you know, put themselves in harm's way. And just even now the, you know, the, the heightened risk and the, you know, in the sense informed consent that they understand that, you know, the rules are out the window or the rules are different or the rules don't exist anymore. And nevertheless, um, you know, specifically train and get involved and do those kinds of things is, is just, you know, uh, just to the highest in my, you know, level of esteem and respect. So, well, I know we're starting to run out of time. I still have a few more questions I want to kind of sure. go through. So um, what got you to Antarctica? <laughs> uh, well, uh, a dream. Uh -huh. always get 
uh, a very slow moving boat. I was gonna, yeah. Oh, like, yeah, I was going to say, but I'm pumped. <laughs> very slow moving boat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a Russian icebreaker going, yeah, they, they say the choppiest oceans in the world are the Drake Passage. Oh, and yeah. And uh, we went on a wilderness medicine expedition. And Valerie and I were fortunate enough to go and, and lead a group in and uh, spent quite a bit of time there going into the Antarctic Peninsula, wow. which was just teeming with wildlife. And yet you could see the effects of climate change, global warming, and our ozone layer, no all kidding. those things. Wow. Very and um, yeah, it was a fascinating trip fascinating trip it didn't quite go the way we thought there was a, a ship that was in distress uh past the antarctic circle and there was a maritime distress that went out so our ship uh we left what we were doing looking at wildlife and um, along with a uh, uh argentinian naval ship to rescue this boat which had probably steered off a little too far and it was filled with um, other people looking and exploring Antarctica, mostly British. Uh -huh. So we took them on board and um, it was, it was just really interesting to be in that type of austere setting with uh, really horrendous winds and weather. And you can realize uh, how quickly things turn in that environment. And it's really not meant for human habitation. Right. So the boat, well, got, their boat got in trouble? Yeah, they did. Their boat got in trouble. It got stranded. It started sinking. So oh, we gosh. were able to get there enough to pull them out. And it turned out uh, the we had a historian on board. Their historian was uh, Shackleton's, uh, I think, great nephew. Oh, my uh, gosh. <laughs> Gee. Of the Ernest uh, 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 Shackleford um, expeditions. And as you may know, the first person to reach the South Pole, trivia question, um, was not a Scott, Admiral the Scott, uh, the Falcon, the Brit. It was actually Roald Edmondson, a Norwegian. Oh, really? And, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was a Norwegian. And it was, it was not Scott. In fact, the historian uh, would not admit the Norwegians beat the British to the South Pole, even at that point. So that was quite a... <laughs> The story. So he and I got in a couple of arguments. I'm of Norwegian. Yeah, I was gonna say the Ericsson probably came out in you, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 that's yeah. You get an explorer's nerd fight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, and for, fortunate for them, I guess it didn't sound like necessarily anyone was injured. But I mean, how fortuitous a to be saved and be saved by a boat full of emergency room physicians, <laughs> you know. So. An emergency physician. Yeah. <laughs> Good news, bad news. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great! Wow, what no, uh, what what an adventure! It's just like another planet, and most of the days are are you know rather gray, and you see a lot of grays and black and white, obviously with the snow. But at sunset, it is spectacular, and it's because of the location you are on Earth. You see every color imaginable. And as you know, when you're in the U.S. and you're watching a sunset, you go, hurry up, hurry up, take a look. It's going down and sinking, and you can watch it maybe a minute. Mm -hmm. There, the, the, the sun setting just hangs. It just hangs there. And wow. for hours, you see this symphony of colors oh. that you just don't see anywhere else on Earth. Um, just a fascinating, fascinating place that you know we're really – we're losing, we're slowly losing this amazing chunk of land that wow. is so misunderstood. Right. Well, it was an adventure in a variety of ways, it sounds like. So, well, I, like I said, you know, I, I, I want to grow up and be you, Tim, but for, lis <laughs> for listeners that also share my uh, desire, what kind of advice would you give to someone interested in doing the kinds of work you do, be it um, the academic side, the research side, the the, the gung-ho humanitarian side, you know, what, where, where would someone start? How, how, would, uh, how would you deconstruct it and for others to follow your, your lead? Well, uh, you know, find your own path, definitely. You don't need to follow mine. Um, follow your heart. Uh, also, if you're going to go international, pick an area of need 
a region of need or a country maybe you have connections with. Maybe it's your culture. Uh, and what I'd really encourage you to do, for those of you interested, it's okay to pick one country. You don't have to go to 17 or 90 different countries. Um, those that go to one country and sustain a program, I really have a lot of respect. Uh, there's a family practitioner in Chicago that only goes to the Philippines. He's not of Philippine descent. He just felt a calling to the Philippines. And what he does, he brings toothbrushes and eyeglasses uh, and every year, and he's made a huge impact on dental hygiene and, and, and eyewear. And that's what he does. That's what he's decided to do, and he's done it for 20-plus years. Wow. Uh, something like that I just have so much respect for. And also, if you're going to do it, find someone in country that can tell you, like our Rwanda example, what they need mm -hmm. um, and, and respect them and listen to them. And also the programs I've been involved in that have been the most successful have had not only someone from the U.S. who's very motivated and someone in country, say in Vietnam, who's very motivated to make a difference in their country, but someone that has their foot in both soils. Mm. Maybe they're a natural Vietnamese citizen. I think of uh, two individuals that, that we know at UIC, the Holtermans, they're pediatric surgeons. She's of Vietnamese descent, uh, Aishwan, and Mark Halterman is of U.S., but they're a married couple that go back to Vietnam two, three times a year, and because Aishwan has her foot in both soils, she fled Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City in 1975. Wow. Because of her connection to Vietnam and the U.S., and she goes back and forth, those programs really work. So you want someone in country, someone in our country, but you really want someone that has an idea of what life is like in the Western world and really what it's like in country. And if you have that combination, it tends to work quite well. The other thing I would say is you don't have to go six months. You don't have to go for a year. If you can, God bless you. That's great. And not everyone can do that with family and career or finances. Even if you can go for a week or two, I think short-term mission work is important. Sometimes it relieves those who are working long hours and months and years. Uh, but it also gives you a heart for this type of work, for this humanitarian work. So maybe when your life settles down a bit, and you go to the next stage of your career, uh, then you can give more time. And it also just increases awareness. And then, as we talked about before, never think that local outreach is uncool. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hear people and you hear my career and you think, oh, my God, you know, you got to go to Madagascar and save the lemurs. To really <laughs> impact. No, go to your neighborhood, go to your food pantry, go to a shelter, um, rebuild uh, the infrastructure of your, your whoops I think we've lost Tim for a little bit here uh, bear with me How about now? Yeah, you're good. We're good. Just had a little Skype hiccup there. So. Okay. Yeah, I think you're yeah making, I faded out there a little. Yeah, yeah, I think you're making the point that, you know, again, back to the you don't necessarily need a passport to do good in the world, that there's, you know, plenty of need down the street just as much as, you know, around the globe. So um, I guess maybe kind of last couple of questions. Um, what's next, you know, for you, Tim? What's Do you, do you have a bucket list or, or what's on your, your agenda Another Skype hiccup here. Is, okay. is that bad right there? Yeah, you're good. You're bad. Yeah. So uh, it was just a, like, one of my last questions of uh, kind of what's what's next for you? What's do you have a bucket list or what's coming up? <laughs> uh, I'd like to continue the the work we're doing in conflict areas, particularly for me personally in Syria. Mm -hmm. uh, I, that's 
going to be a country in need for the next 10 to 20 years. And before the war, it really was a well-developed medical care system. So hopefully to bring that back awful uh, situation there currently. And then also work in Ukraine. I think uh, Ukraine's are, uh, Ukrainians are wonderful people, uh, very strong people, but they're getting a lot of push uh, in the Eastern conflict zone. And I think that area of the world in Eastern Europe, um, with the ongoing run and some of those countries that were part of the former Soviet Union is a really important part of the world these days. Um, and also continuing on, uh, my love of nature and natural venoms and toxins. There's a concept of one health, which you've probably heard of, where it's the inner action of human and bio life mm -hmm. and how it's so important in uh, the spreading of disease and understanding of disease states and looking at the importance of climate, animal life, and how that interacts with human health is another thing I'm really interested in. Um, and I'd also like to uh, continue... Uh, uh, my, what I think is a Guinness Book of World Records for having the highest elevation wiffle ball game um, <laughs> is another goal. I, you'll have a lot of people uh, being contenders for that now that you said that. So. <laughs> it's, 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 I love it because the wiffle it's easy to carry, um, and it breaks down cultural barriers. I bring one wherever I go. I've played on all seven continents, nope. and I have, oh. I think, 20,000 feet. So I do think I have the highest of uh, the wiffle ball game ever <laughs> that's, that, so, but, uh, that's probably a record that will, will stand a long time. So that's that's pretty impressive, man. Yeah, we'll see. So that that's a lofty goal. Uh, <laughs> But no, it's uh, it's been a great life. I'm really blessed. I come from really good family, good stock, so I have no excuse. Um, dad, Norwegian. My mom, Danish. They're very happy people. Um, but no, great opportunities. And, uh, and pointing back to you, Chris, I'm really impressed with your career and your humanitarian heart and the good work you do in helping out those that are vulnerable. So shows like this are, are fun, but hopefully they uh, motivate some people to take on a career like this and make a difference Good. in well, other people. Thank you for saying that. You're always, you know, such a kind, kind gentleman. And I, I think, I think so. Again, I think people, if they get to know you a little bit better and know about the kind of work that you've done, I think you're quite the inspirational figure. And, and I just, you know, really value our friendship, I guess in closing, if, um, people want to learn more about the work that you're doing or what's going on at the humanitarian, the Harvard humanitarian initiative, or if they want to contribute uh, time or talent or, or dollars or whatever, what are the best ways to learn more about that or to connect? Well, uh, if you go to the Harvard humanitarian website, HHI, you put that on the, the Google uh, browser, it'll come right up. You can see that some of the programs we're doing in there by far. It's not just me and Mike and Barry. It's a lot of people doing uh, urban resilience and a signal program and uh, satellite imaging, women in war, um, just some amazing programs that are going on here. Um, also, we're raising funds for our Harvard Scholar at Risk program. These are getting... Uh, scholars who are in uh, countries where their life is threatened, where they're unable to do their work. Uh, we've had scholars at risk from, uh, from Yemen, mm. from Syria, from Iran, from Iraq, uh, from Libya. Uh, I'm probably missing a few, but it's interesting. It seems to be all the seven countries that uh, have trouble getting into the United States. Wow. Um, they're scholars. Mm not just in health, um, 
but in uh, the arts, in literature, in economics, business, architecture. They're amazing people who want to be in their countries, but their life is threatened because they really are brilliant. And those that may dictate in that country feel they're a threat. And wow. We try to not only annihilate them, but their families and their programs. So we have a program where we give them asylum, in a sense, for a year or so um, until it's safe for them to return. So there is a way uh, to give to the Harvard scholar. Well, we'll make sure I, we're, our Skype is breaking up again, um, but we'll make sure, Tim, that we get that in, in the show notes. So people that are interested in getting more involved or being able to um, learn more about these various and sundry initiatives. And I know there's also a periodic um, set of courses and things too that the initiative uh, sponsors. So I think there's a, a variety of ways that if people are interested or have gotten inspired by uh, today's conversation that uh, they can reach out and, and get more involved. All right, well, I, my Skype is saying that we have a poor network connection. So and very much uh, appreciate being able to have you on, Tim. I look forward to uh, maybe being able to have a round two and get into some other things. So thanks so much for being a guest today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I, my pleasure, Chris. Thanks for your great work. Let's climb a mountain together soon. And let's bring our daughters. Let's bring all our kids. Let's make it a family there. You're on. It's a deal. Take care, my friend. All right. So much a pleasure. Thank you. An honor to be on your show. Thanks, Chris. You bet. Thank you, Tim. Bye-bye. Living a Life in Full is a production of Stout Media, a subsidiary of Gordian Knot, LLC. Assistant producer, Gracie Wong. Music, Dan O'Brien. Post-production, Sam Rood. Graphics, Larry Newberry. Executive producer and host, Dr. Chris Stout. To learn more, stop by our website, alifeinfull.org, for show notes. And please recommend us to your friends and leave us a review on iTunes. Thanks.